Just ahead on American Black Journal, we'll check in with the nonprofit organization that's delivering public health services to Detroit residents. Plus, an east side boxing gym is giving some Detroit kids hope for the future. And we'll have some highlights from this year's Urban Wheel Awards. There's a lot ahead, so stay tuned. Eric wants to know, what does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. The Institute for Population Health was created in 2012 to provide quality public health services for Detroit residents. Former Mayor Dave Bing initiated the change as part of his efforts to cut costs in city government. After a year in existence, the Institute's progress report is really impressive. For example, there has been a 30 six percent increase in both environmental and restaurant ins inspections across the city good news for those of you who eat out uh, immunizations have jumped 38 percent and there's about a 74 percent increase in the number of people tested and treated for sexually transmitted diseases here to talk more about this nonprofit public health model is the president and ceo of ipH Loretta Davis welcome to American black journal thank you thank so those you numbers are are really shocking I mean I, th that's a very stark turnaround in a short period of time. Yes, Stephen, we were very pleased to be able to uh, report these numbers. Um, it just shows that it's a great business model when you are able to get the right people, give them the right technology, and put them in the right environment. You can get really incredible results in a fairly short amount of time. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people, I think, were very nervous about this idea of taking taking services that were part of government and moving them outside of government. Mm -hmm. Some people call it privatization. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not exactly privatization of a, of a, of a, of a public service, but it is saying, well, let's, let's, uh, let's take it outside of government and, yeah. and see if we can operate it a, a little better. Mm -hmm. It seems like this is working really well for not just for you and for the organization, but it's working really well for the people who need those services. Absolutely. You know, the way we look at it is a strong public-private par partnership. You know, lots of people talk about the value of a public-private partnership, but when it's done, sometimes it causes a huge change. So I was really proud of the fact that we were uh, given the opportunity to be able to take an evidence-based model and turn that into a public-private uh, partnership that, as you said, really benefits the uh, the residents and visitors of the city of Detroit because at the end of the day that's what it's all that's about. That's what it's it's about delivering the services that's it's right. not necessarily about who's paying or uh, how it's managed. Right. Uh, so uh, tell me about the model uh, and where where it came from I and mean, this is not the first city yes. to try this right? Yeah. Well it's the first city to take on the total responsibility of a local health department. Of a health department, okay. That's right. Now there are about five other uh, city-based public health institutes around the country and they're in large urban areas like Detroit, Just like, like Detroit. New York and uh, New Orleans and places like that. So we were familiar with the model but they have taken on bits and pieces maybe they've taken on the WIC program the Women, Infants, Children's sure. Program, or a few others. So the thing that made uh, this partnership so unique, and it really generated a lot of interest around the country, is because the Institute for Population Health was taking on the entire uh, responsibility for service delivery that the uh, health department had uh, formally done. Right. But the relationship with the uh, Department of Health and Wellness Promotion is an important one because the public health authority remains with the city. With the city. It remains with the city. Right. And so that makes for a uh, excellent partnership because we're able to bring on the staff, provide the services, and certainly uh, keeping authority under right. uh, the city control is excellent. Right, and that's uh, essentially having government uh, set the standards and enforce them still, that's which right. is what we need government to do. That's but, exactly but sometimes right. somebody else can deliver 
the services more effectively. That's right. So, so how, why is it that, um, for example, some of the stuff, uh, the, some of the numbers I was talking about have to do with people's awareness. I mean, people have to sort of seek this out. How, how is that part of it different now than it was before? Well, we're able to uh, enter into multiple contracts with various different uh, marketing and media companies because that's really not our bailiwick. Our right. bailiwick is to deliver health services. So when we're trying to develop pamphlets or things like that, they're just not as effective as when you can uh, work with professionals to put on an all-out campaign that says, this is who we are, this is how you access us, these are our hours. But then when you do that, they have to actually get what has been advertised. Sure. So that's the other end of it. Uh, one of the reasons why this model is so successful is that we have been able to hire enough staff to get the job done. When it was a part of um, governmental public health, there were always things like hiring freezes or sure. furloughs and those kinds of things affect the ability to once the person comes through the door, for them to be able to get to the actually get what they're, to what get they're what, there for. That's right, and the and the best is word of mouth. Right, it either harms you or it's the best thing right. you can get. Yeah. Right. So so uh, the funding for this, uh, yes. you you get some money from the city, but it's a nonprofit. Uh, are you raising money privately as well? Well, actually, the money comes starts at the Michigan Department of Community Health, uh, and sure. then it goes into the city, and then right, for us. it's a pass through. That's sure. right, it's a pass through. So the majority of our money still is state or federal uh, dollars, but our model, Stephen, is based on a social entrepreneur model. So. Uh, our focus right now is not so much on fundraising, although it is on, you know, going, um, making ourselves attractive to foundations and places like that. But we are also looking at those services that can be provided that uh, people really need that are in the realm of population-based health that we have expertise in and that they would want to pay for. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, so people are paying for some of the some of the services themselves. Yes, and these are not uh, necessarily our patients. These are things like we have this phenomenal epidemiology staff, okay. and many um, smaller entities in the city. They may have grants. They may be collecting a lot of data, but they don't have the capacity internally to bring it together to uh, make a report on it and those kinds of things. And they don't have the money or the need to hire their own epidemiologists. So. As part of that, they may uh, contract with us with you to do our, that work to I do see. that work for them, and see, and that's a big part of what we think is the value to the community, because we also we want to be a strong entity, but the one of the goals of a public health institute is to also help other public health help build up be uh, strong as well. Right, right. So we'll do back office support if it's an entity that's doing bang up service but they're not as good on keeping their books uh, and also things like this epidemiology being able to manipulate data and to analyze it and to put it into a report form where it's usable and they can make decisions based on data. Right, right. Uh, I mentioned in the open the, the, the numbers on environmental and yes. restaurant inspections. Uh, I, I think people don't think about how how sparse that had become in Detroit, that we don't, uh, the city who just was incapable of keeping up with those kind of things, and those are serious public health That's management right. issues in a, in a city. Some restaurants had not had an inspection in about two years, and it was because you know the uh, the staff just not having enough. They staff don't have enough to people to done. do it. Absolutely. Yeah. So now we're able to hire. We're able to hire quickly. We're able to pay a competitive salary, and all of these things have come into play to get the kinds of numbers that we're reporting. And on the environmental piece, people don't think about that either. But you know, when you're putting your child in a daycare center, right? Or if you or your your teenage daughter or son or deciding to get a tattoo, you want our staff to have gone in there yeah. and inspected. And make sure service. it's okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and uh, of course, in Detroit, we also have a number of other very serious public health issues that That's you guys correct. are able That's to deal correct. with. One of the areas that we're very pleased that we've seen an increase in is the uh, number of people who are coming in for HIV counseling and testing. Right. This is still uh, an area, the kind of the epicenter for HIV. Sure. We've been able to routinize the HIV testing into some of our other services, which is what nationally has been called for for several years. So we've been able to do that. And it's just uh, a great model and standard of care because if someone comes in 
let's say for a sexually transmitted disease treatment, then we're able also to talk to them about you can HIV. Get other, you can get other uh, kinds of services. Absolutely, right. and get them into treatment if they're already HIV positive, or get them into prevention counseling if they're negative and they're wanting now to know how to keep themselves negative. Right. Uh, what kind of feedback are you getting from the community about uh, this program? We're going into the second uh, yeah, full year. Going into the second are people full year. responding? People are responding well. Right from the beginning, um, we started with client satisfaction surveys. We have over 8,000 surveys completed and we have about a 87 percent positivity rate. So that's fantastic. Sure. Uh, we were able to move out of Herman Kiefer, which has just been uh, a <laughs> landmark to the yeah, city yeah. Uh, of Detroit. And But it was, it's a 101 year yeah, old. And it's not been maintained the way it should have been. It's, uh, yeah. And it is because, I mean, it's very costly. There's no money. To yeah. There's no money to do that. So we've been able to move out and base the services in the community. Uh, our Woodward location, the bus stops right in front of our door. Okay. And so See, people perfect. love that. Yeah. It's perfect. Perfect. Uh, our northeast location is just an excellent location on East Seven Mile, and so all of that has been uh, very positive. Gets it all closer. Gets it all closer, closer to the people who are supposed to be closer served. Closer to the people who are supposed to be served, and access has been wonderful. But the uh, the other part of the community is our peers, you know, other, sure. and so we are still uh, we still work very closely with them to explain, you know, what we do, why we do it, and I believe that for the most part, many of them are now starting to see the benefit. Whenever you make a big change right. like this, people are skeptical. That's what right. is this going to mean? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? That it, that That's right. Happened. And what has happened is 280 positions still in the city of Detroit. Right. A Jobs. building that had yeah. been vacant for 11 years, yeah. now occupied by the Institute. Yeah. So very it's been good. very positive. All right. Well, great to have you here. Good luck in your second year. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Just ahead on American Black Journal, the sport of boxing is helping some Detroit youngsters boost their grades and their self-esteem. We'll explain right after this look at some noteworthy moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1959, the Detroit Police Department integrated its patrol cars, allowing black and white officers to ride together for the first time. In 1966, an eclectic band from Toronto named the Minor Birds, recorded two singles for Motown Records. The group featured R&B funkster Rick James and folk rock icon Neil Young. And in 1997, veteran state lawmaker Morris Hood Jr. became the first African American to chair the powerful Michigan House of Representatives Appropriations Committee. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book, On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. The downtown boxing gym on Detroit's east side is changing young lives in the community. The kids who work out at the gym not only sharpen their mental and physical fitness, but they also get help with their schoolwork and take part in community service projects. Here to tell us more about the youth boxing program is founder and head coach Kelly Sweeney. He's joined by one of the gym's young boxers, David Davis. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm glad you're here because I have been hearing, I have to say, I have been hearing about this program all over town. I, I pick up magazines, I see about it. I heard Chelsea Clinton uh, has been there several times. This this really has has taken off. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful experience right now for the gym. It's a, it's a great time. Yeah, yeah. So tell me how you came up with this uh, with this idea. Well, I started training my my um, son and daughter, and it went from there. Then I started training more kids. You know, once they see your kids doing it, everybody want to be. <laughs> everybody involved. wants to do everybody it. Right? Comes, so you know, I saved the money. I got the place, and uh, just kids were attracted to it. And in the process of that. I can see that the kids needed a lot more than just boxing. Yeah. You can once see, you get them in the door. Yeah, once you, you get them get in the door, you idea. find out what's really going on with the kids. And, you know, they need a lot more help than just boxing. Yeah, yeah. So, David, you're one of the, the young boxers. Had you ever had you ever boxed before? Um, no. My first day in the gym, <laughs> it was just... Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little I'm a little nervous about this whole idea of of kids boxing. I mean, it's 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 fighting. It's violent, right? I mean, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not it's not really violent. It's like uh it's a uh, it's controlled. Um, right. They have rules. It's the same rules that apply to the Olympic athletes that apply to those kids. It's okay. the Same safety uh, procedures. Everything is the same. Yeah. So how does that how does that feel? That first time you get in that ring and um, someone's there to punch you, right? The first time I got in the ring, it, I was just amazed. Like. I didn't expect what I what I saw. Okay. Before. Like when I first walked in the gym, 
I saw um, other people training, and they made it look so easy. And the first yeah. time I, when I first got into the ring, it wasn't easy at yeah. all. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> There's someone in there who wants to <laughs> knock your block off, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so how much has the training helped? And I imagine um, you're much more comfortable now. Training has helped a lot. Um, I won a lot of tournaments. I won the National Power Tournament. I've been all over fighting fighting in different tournaments. Yeah, yeah. And Inside. you're being modest because at one time you were ranked the number one boxer in your age group, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. Thank you. Um, when I first won my first tournament, it was amazing. Like, I just knew, like, nobody ever could take this away from me. Right, right. And um, I worked hard for it. So the, the tutoring and, and things that you're doing, how did you get the people to, to help support that? Um, we reached out to the community, and the community came back in a positive way, you know, because once I got to seeing the kids there and I, you know, you can tell, like, when they bring their homework in the, into the gym and you see that, you know, there's nobody around that can help you with this homework. Right. You know you have to reach out at that point. Right, you know? right. You know, so you just imagine how many kids sit at home and this math is new to their parents or sure. this math is new to their cousins and uncles. <laughs> so, you know, we need to reach out to the right people and we reached out to Teach America and a few other organizations and, you know, we had some volunteers come in and... It's been a positive thing. Yeah, and the and the growth. I mean, uh, the the interest from from other people has got to have oh, yeah. brought in some financial interest, right? And, and yeah, the, um, opportunity to to make it bigger. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. Um, you know, you have like uh, people in the Eastern Market area, um, the business community, a lot of different organizations that you know you you don't necessarily you think going to come in. Right. But these guys have came in and and they they've helped in any way they can. And even they, even their employees come down. They even had their employees come down and work with and work with the work with the kids, with the yeah. Kids, yeah. 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 Some some of them even hired our kids. Jeez, that's so, uh, that's that's outstanding. You know, not only not only have they 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 helped uh, teach the kids uh, academically, they've hired these kids. Right. So. Right. Right. Uh, so David, tell me about the the, the neighborhood that uh, that you come from and and what this kind of opportunity means uh, in that place. Um, I come from a middle class neighborhood. My neighborhood isn't really horrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, coming to the gym every day is amazing. Yeah. Um, besides just boxing and training, I also get help with my education and homework. Like um, some days, I need help like with geometry, yeah. and chemistry, and um, the gym it has helped me a lot. Definitely on um, finals. I just had finals, like, <laughs> finals, last week. right? Yeah. And the tutors. We all helped. remember what that was. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. Yeah. But the tutors helped me out a lot and passed all my finals. Yeah, well, that's good. that's that's great. I mean, uh, even uh, the, your neighborhood you were talking about. Uh, what, what I was really asking about was the other opportunities for this kind of thing. I mean, we've closed so many rec centers uh, in the city. Uh, there, there really aren't a lot of places for kids your age to go do stuff like this, right? Yeah, um, my neighborhood, it doesn't really have any rec centers or playgrounds or anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only thing we have is a playground, but it's not up, it's not up cut or up yeah. cut. Yeah. Like the grass is too high, they don't cut it, and some of the things over there need to be replaced. Yeah, yeah. And so now you're, you've been at the center long enough that you're helping other kids, right? I mean, that's part of the part of the deal. I also um, help like other kids who are younger than me. I'm like a mentor, if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> a good ask, thing, you right? You me too. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like, um, they look they look up to me in the ring, and I also help them outside the ring, like yeah. schoolwork. Right, right. Uh, do, do the kids, uh, what, what's the age range? Oh, we go from uh, uh, 8 to 18. Okay. But we have kids there as young as 4, and we have kids there who who won't leave, <laughs> like 20 years old. <laughs> right, right. Guy's but still there, but he's, he's helping the other kids. So. Yeah, and that, well, and that speaks to the, the, the kind of uh, magnetism you, right. you, you develop when you have something positive like this that people right. are involved in and excited about. They don't want to leave, right? Right, yeah. This is, it's, a, it's a family environment. You know, you get guys who started when they were nine years old. Now you have a guy that's 20 years old. He, this is all he know. Right. So right. he's coming back to the gym, you know, and the kids get a chance to see him. They they know that he went. He's in college now. They know he graduated on right. time. And he was one of them at uh, right. at some point. Right. And some of these guys are like uh, Anthony Flagg. He's actually working a job and he's in college too and keeping a 3.0. Right. Right. So. Yeah, tell me about the the kids who <clears throat> you see coming through that uh, the doors. I mean, I'm always curious. People who work with kids in the city right mm -hmm. now. What are the kind of things that you feel like they're bringing with them 
Uh, you know, so um, um, when they come through the door, you know, kids have a lot of issues that they deal with, you know, and um, one of the things that I noticed is a lot of kids get bullied at school. Yeah. And um, you have kids who, who bully other kids, but when they get to the gym, you know, boxing is an equalizer. Right. <laughs> boxing is an equalizer. You right. know, kids who, who are bullies, they find out instantly that you're not that tough because right. we have national champions here. David's one of the national champions. Right. We, have a, we have a host of na national champions <laughs> here. You know, so you check your ego at the door. Right. So you, you, you have to humble yourself instantly. And the kids who've been bullied, they empower, it, it empowers them. It empowers they, them, they, right. they, they, they get confidence. Not only that, you have kids who come through the door who probably can't read or write, you know? If you can't read or write, so you're in, you're in school, the first thing you do is act out to try and get out of the classroom. To try to get out. To get out of the classroom. Sure. And, and people may label you and say, well, this kid has a problem. No, he doesn't. He, he can't read. Right. Somebody needs to take time. Somebody needs to take time and teach and him. identify that problem. So we get kids who can barely read. Yeah. So now, you know, you take a kid who's a straight F student or a straight E student, you turn that kid into a B or C student, he feels great. Right. And all of a sudden, he feels differently yeah, about the whole not world. just school, but everything. It's, it's a whole new world opens up to him. Yeah. How, how do you train young kids to box? Uh, it seems like something boxing that is, uh, would be pretty tough. Boxing is an easy, is an easy sport to train. You know, you, you, you go through, it's, it's nothing, it's like, it's not like you're reinventing the wheel. Well, sure. You, you're throwing a one-two <laughs> and you're throwing a hook or uppercut. You know? Right, right. The, 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 and you got to teach them to defend themselves, though, yeah, right? Yeah, to block. Yeah, and... yeah, to block and to slip and move. That's, that's very simple. It's all about uh, it's all about uh, repetition. You do it day in and you do it day out. Yeah. You know, you, you go through the routine every day. It becomes a, a, a second nature. So when it happens, you react to it, and you don't get hit like the average guy on the street <laughs> who gets hit and he's surprised and falls straight out. Right. You right. get hit and you react. You react. And that's sure. the same thing with our academic program. You know, you get used to seeing uh, tutoring. You get used to studying techniques and you, you you learn you learn it day in day out it becomes natural it becomes natural for right you. so when you're in school you know you go through it yeah uh are you are you a native uh, detroit oh yes yeah east side. so so when you were a kid how did you how did you get into to, to boxing you know what um i was one of those kids who um who wasn't doing very well in school so I acted out and I got myself kicked out of class <laughs> on purpose many a days. All the time, right? Oh, I, I wanted to get kicked out of class almost every day. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, someone pulled me aside, uh, a family member, and uh, showed me, like, you know, if you, you can, you can uh, harness that energy that you're yeah. using yeah. and use it for something good and positive. So yeah. It doesn't have to always be a violent outburst. Right. It right. can be a controlled outburst. Yeah. Well, it seems like you're doing that now for sure with the kids. And it's great to have you here. And good luck to you, David. Thank you. Thank you. All week, crowds have packed Kobo Center for the North American International Auto Show. Each year, the Urban Wheel Awards kick off the auto show by recognizing and honoring diversity in the auto industry. Here's some highlights from this year's event. Maria and I are, are we're really honored and uh, just to be here to be your host tonight for the 18th Annual Urban um, Wheel Awards. And we couldn't be proud to be joining you with tonight's honorees. Thank you all. Long before I got into the car business, my mom, which was my hero, which is deceased now, told me a few things. She said, boy, stay out of trouble, get good grades, and act like 100% of the time that I'm on your shoulder watching what you do. So tonight, mom, you'll be happy to know and be proud of your son that you are the mom of the 2014 Urban Wheels Award Dealer of the Year. Thank you, Mom. So we've, uh, we've been able to uh, engage on many levels of the industry. You know, no, we're no longer excluded, you know, from the various networks. I think the, uh, there's a, a lot more uh, minority journalists covering the show, a lot more of us attending the charity preview, a lot more of us are engaged. Oh, and in fact, uh, when we first started, there were CEOs and presidents who led the charge who had no minority employees. They actually funded the event, the first event. Uh, BMW, Mercedes, Jaguar, they had no diversity. And, and so uh, it has been a huge change in terms of the employment, supplier relations, dealer relations. I think over, over in general, we probably helped to generate over a billion dollars back into our communities. I'm super excited because last year I was uh, one of the presenters. So this year I'm actually hosting. So it's just amazing because I'm from Detroit and, uh, you know, Detroit talent and Crazy Artist Fellow. And so it's just a pleasure to be part of this amazing event.
event that celebrates diversity and entrepreneurship. It is just great. And, you know, to be here at the Urban Wheel Awards at a time when the auto industry is doing so well uh, and Detroit is shining so bright, uh, it's a great night. It's going to be a great couple of weeks. I think it's beautiful, you know, for, for the city of Detroit, you know, um, definitely because it puts a positive light on Detroit, and that's something that we that, that we desperately need. You know, so it's good to see people come together for a positive for a positive event, and I'm glad to be a part of it. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can get more information about all of our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. Eric wants to know. What does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy, know your own power.